You're listening to the Phillies Nation podcast with Ty Darbert and Johnny Heller on philliesnation.com. What's going on, everybody? You're listening to another episode of the Phillies Nation podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Heller. Uh, Some more front office news this week from the Phillies as they hired a general manager. Um, So the front office structure appears to be set. Uh, As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Ty Darbert. Ty, what's going on? Not much. Yeah, like you said, Philly's finally making some moves. They looks like they have their front office in place for this upcoming season and probably the future after that. So it'll be interesting to get into. So why don't why don't we do that? The Phillies they promoted former outfielder Sam Fold to GM, Jorge Valandia promoted to assistant. GM, he was a former player as well. And Terry Ryan, he ran the Twins in the past. He had been with the Phillies in kind of a scouting role. He is promoted to special assistant to the general manager. So, yeah, like you said, Phillies making some moves, putting the pieces into place. And like I said, they have their structure. So the only thing left are the, the actual baseball moves, I guess. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is late December, uh, and the Phillies have not really made any baseball moves other than signing Neftali Feliz. Um, but, you know, I think uh, a couple episodes ago, we were wondering if they would even hire anybody. Um, and now they hired Dombrowski, they hired Fold. Um, definitely, I think, I think it's a pretty smart pairing. Uh, bring in the experienced guy, the winner as you might say, um, in Dombrowski and then, you know, a young, a young guy to kind of groom behind him. And, and Fold has been uh, a finalist for multiple manager positions throughout baseball. Uh, I think the Red Sox wanted him. Most yeah. Recently. He, was, he was almost the, the Red Sox manager before they brought Alex Cora back. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting that he's going into a, a, a front office role instead, but still he, he seems to be a rising star um in the game and I think it's it's smart for the Phillies to um you know put someone like him in in that role yeah I mean he he said even in the the zoom press conference yesterday that you know the manager and the general manager position they're not as different as they once were probably and a lot of what goes into both of those roles is making sure the team is on the same page from a from a strategical and philosophical standpoint, um, both, both roles kind of have to work together. I mean, you you saw it with, with Matt Clintack and Gabe Kapler, I think Uh, they were aligned on a lot of things in a lot of ways. And I think that's kind of how it works in today's game of baseball, though, those two positions, it's not going to be like, like the old days where it's, the front office doing one thing and then it's, you know, the, the old manager that's uh, clashing with the front office a lot and isn't going to listen. It's not going to be like, it's not going to be like the movie Moneyball where the front office wants one thing and the manager uh, isn't, isn't playing Carlos or he's playing Carlos Pena over Scott Hatterberg. It's not, it's not the same way anymore. And so I, I think that's why it does make sense that he's been, Sam Fold has been looked at uh, for both roles and the Phillies promote him. You know, he's the general manager, but he's pretty clearly not the guy calling the shots. That's Dave Dombrowski as president of, bas- of baseball operations. And I, I think it's just a way for them to give Fold a promotion as somebody they like and make sure he's not going around interviewing for all these manager spots. They're going to give him a little more power in the organization. He'll learn under Dave Dombrowski and um, Dombrowski hinted at it in the press conference as well. Maybe one day when he retires, Sam Fold is the next one up or Sam Fold has a, a little bit of a head start if there's a GM or president spot open elsewhere. So that's kind of my thoughts on on the whole role with Sam Fold and why that makes sense, even though he's been considered a managerial candidate as well. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, 
And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Fold's playing career. Um, he played for, I think, the Athletics. He played for the Twins. He played for the Rays. Um, so do you have any any moments from his career that, that you wanted to highlight here? Oh, all right. So first of all, he – I don't – he was a pretty good defender, but more so he made ridiculous catches like all the time. He, I remember like from 2011 ish to 2013 ish, like baseball tonight always had Sam fold on the web gens. They called him super Sam. Like he was a, he was a staple of that show for a couple of years. Cause some of the catches he made were absolutely ridiculous. I remember there was one, I posted one video on my Twitter of him like hosing someone at the plate while while he was on the A's. John Lester was pitching for the A's that game. So that was kind of, that was an interesting thing there. But no, the best one of his career was when he was on the Rays. He was playing right field against the Chicago White Sox in Chicago. They had the bases loaded with two outs. And former Philly Juan Pierre, like, roped a ball into right field at the warning track. And if you have any clue about Juan Pierre's career, like, he was not one to hit the ball to the warning track very often, but he did. And it would have cleared the bases probably if it got down. But Fold made, a, like, an insane diving catch on the warning track. And BJ Upton, I remember he talked about it. Uh, like he said he was going wild in center field and it was called one of the best catches in Ray's history like it was it it was pretty good and he had a bunch of plays like that so that's the kind of I I kind of made this comp yesterday the way he played outfield was like a young Bryce Harper and obviously Sam Fold could not hit in the way that Bryce Harper could um, obviously or else he would have played a a little bit longer in the major leagues, but he, um, they, the, the way that they both played when they were younger was like, they would just run into walls all the time, die for everything. Like that's the kind of outfield play. I think you like to see, maybe it's not the wisest way to play if you're Bryce Harper and there's a lot, you know, you have a lot of value to your team and you don't want to get hurt, but for a role player like Sam Fold, that's what, I think that's what you want to see somebody going all out on the defensive end. Yeah. From, from that to the general manager in less than a decade, Um, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, So uh, another uh, Phillies, I guess, piece of news came out yesterday um, from John Heyman that they had an offer on the table for JT real muto. Um, I mean, what what do you think th- that their their first offer, if this is what that is, what do you think it looks like? Um, I think it's probably just like a if there is indeed an offer on the table, it's probably like a very first offer, initial offer kind of thing. Like I don't I don't even know what the numbers would be, but like five years, one hundred million. Yeah, or something. five five one hundred, like. I don't know, four, 480, something like that, I think would be the initial offer uh, to kind of get negotiations started. But, you know, without details coming out, what, it was just kind of a, a minimal report saying the Phillies have an offer, but uh, the rest of it was a hashtag mystery market, as, as Heyman put it. So uh, I, there's not a lot that you can take from it, but it seems that, you know, the – the Phillies have started talking with Yamito's camp a little bit. Dombrowski said in the press conference yesterday that he, that Yamito's agent had called him and it wasn't really negotiations, but they had talked a little bit. And Dombrowski said how, how they would like to have Yamito back. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's, you know, I, I think I'm a little, I, I, I think it's a little more likely that they get Ramito back now than maybe I would have said three weeks ago. Yeah, I, I agree that they probably are more likely now than a few weeks ago. Um, just, you know, having a, having a front office structure in place at this point, um, 
makes a difference. And I, I think they're looking for a direction. Uh, and Dombrowski obviously talked about retooling in his press conference a couple weeks ago. And, you know, while that may be like the window is still there, if they re-sign Real Muto uh, to win, to win now, uh, possibly. And, and I also think like you look at the catcher catching market and McCann to the Mets, um, who, who resigned with the Rays? Mike Zunino resigned with the Rays. So really, like, if you're looking at free agent catchers, it's Real Muto and then Yadier Molina, who, you know, I still think probably goes back to St. Louis. And then it's it's just really backup options after that. So it's not like the Phillies have a whole lot of uh, options out there if they don't resign Real Muto. It, it, it's kind of a pairing that makes sense even if you don't consider the fact that Real Muto played in Philadelphia last year. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think yeah. it, 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 it just it lines up in the best possible way with what Real Muto will want on the market and what the Phillies need because they don't really have, you know, if, if they want to compete in 2021, I don't think the best course of action is having Andrew Knapp play well over 100 games for the Phillies. And uh, Matt Gelb in a, in a report yesterday, kind of, he, he said that the Phillies are, they'd rather fix their holes with money than trading a bunch of prospects away. So unless they're trading for a catcher, which apparently they don't seem inclined to do, getting Real Muto back in free agency, it just makes the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and, and that is, that is in, an interesting report because like we've kind of been saying that all along that the Phillies don't need to, um, you know, make any, you know, mind blowing trades or anything to um, put a solid team together. They just have to, to spend the money um, on the right pieces. And, and it, I think it's smart that Dombrowski, you know, sees that and follows that. It's just a matter, I guess, of if, if John Middleton will be on board and, and how much money they're able to spend. Um, but it, it also kind of feels like if they, if they bring back Real Muto, they're more likely to um, try a little bit harder to do better around the fringes of the roster. Do you agree with that? Yeah, that's kind of the way it seems. It's, it seems like if they get Real Muto back on a deal they like, then it's like they're really going to go in and try to compete like they have the past couple of years. Uh, and they'll try to, they'll try to put together a legitimate team, but then the, if they can't get Rio Muto back, it kind of feels like maybe they just like take a step back this year and figure it out for the next year and let the payroll go down. But, you know, at that point, Rio Muto, helps your team in the short term and the we've said it a million times the Phillies core isn't getting any younger so I think going in on this current team for this upcoming season it does make the most sense uh, in the short term and probably long term just because these guys are not getting any younger and kind of wasting away one year of of all of them being together I don't think would make the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Like you said, we've talked about it a million times. Um, before, before we wrap up, I just think we should um, touch a little bit more on the off season in general. Um, you know, there have been a few teams that have signed a couple guys, the, the Kansas city Royals and New York Mets. Um, but not a lot has happened since the off season started well over a month ago. Um, I know the off seasons have been slower of late, but this, you know, this one has felt um, even, even slower. And um, obviously it's, it's due to the pandemic and, and probably the, the winter meetings not being in person and, and all of that. But when do you see it picking up? If it does pick up, like, when do, when do you see the Phillies kind of jumping in and, and, and making their moves? Um, oh, that's kind of tough to say just because there's no real indication that teams are 
even getting close to like signing a lot of players at this point, uh, at least in my opinion. I honestly, unfortunately, feel like this could drag out until it's pretty close to teams like having players report to spring training. And then maybe it's like at that point, players get a feeling like, all right, I have to hurry up and sign with the team. And then, you know, that's kind of a advantage, uh, advantage team and, and person negotiating that contract for the team just because the player feels a little bit of pressure to hurry up and sign. So I think that's kind of the way it could go at this point. Yeah, I agree. And it's, um, it's interesting because we don't really know when, when players are actually going to report um, for spring training. Um, I know there have been reports that last week, Bob Nightingale wrote about how um, the league wants to push back the start of the season Um so players can get vaccinated and, and players are willing to do that as long as it's still a 162 game season. Um, so that'll be, you know, it'll be interesting, interesting seeing how that plays out um, considering the, you know, the CBA expires in December. And yeah, I don't, I don't think the owners have much to much ground to stand on there. Like you have a CBA and when there is when you've played in a pandemic before and you have protocol that you agreed to that in theory i guess is supposed to work and keep the keep the team safe like you can't just not play all the games because you don't feel like it as an owner of a team like owners want they they like to talk about all this risk that they are taking when they buy a team and and uh, how they like to talk about how it's not as profitable as we might think. But if you're taking the risk, part of it is you, these unforeseen circumstances. And you can't just not play the full season that you agreed to just because you don't think it'll be quite as profitable as you would hope. Like that's part of the risk that you take. You have a CBA for a reason. And like they, I don't think that the owners can just, they, they can just not play 162 games because they just don't want to. Yeah. And, and I think uh, to that point too, it's, it's, we're coming off a season where the, the players gave up um, a lot of their salary to play in a shortened season and they're not going to do that again. And they shouldn't do that again. Like you said, it's it's what's what's different about the pandemic now than in July, August, September. They played then, um, and like obviously, it'll be a lot safer once they're vaccinated. But you know, if 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 they have the protocols in place and and they said they worked last year, like they should be playing um, this year. And you know, if they do end up pushing the season back, I I mean, I can't see that happening. And the the players like giving up you know, so that they get prorated salaries like that. I, I just don't see it. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I, I know they already have a, a schedule release for next season. Um, we'll see if that holds up, but that'll do it for this episode of the Philly Nation podcast. Um, you know, hope everyone listening enjoys this holiday week and we'll be, we'll talk to you again next week. You can listen to the Phillies Nation podcast with Ty Daubert and Johnny Heller every Wednesday on philliesnation.com and all streaming services.